Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexis Tigba, and I'm an analyst with Next Year Power. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the June 2017 Next Year Power Dialogue. It is unequivocal that Nigeria is gifted with an array of energy generation resources, from the bountiful coal reserves in the east to the abundant solar radiance radiation in the north, and the vast potential for hydro and wind in the coastal plains of the south. It is therefore lamentable that these resources are not yet fully harnessed to meet the electricity demand in the country. In order to achieve this, the question must be asked, what is the most feasible and cost-effective means of generating electricity in Nigeria? In seeking an answer to this question, our theme for the evening will focus on unraveling the true cost of electricity in Nigeria. To kickstart to kick to kick start the event, give a round, a round of applause for Mr. Patrick Okigbo III. Thank you, Alexis. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the June 2017 Next Year Power Dialogue. As my colleague Alexis already mentioned, uh, this is our monthly public discourse event on the power sector. And the core objectives um, of this session um, are threefold. One is to share information and ideas, knowledge, um, on the evolving power sector in Nigeria. Second is to input into the advocacy process, so good ideas that come out of here, um, we try to input that in the uh, policy process in the country. And third is to create a platform for connections, you know, um, for people to meet, make connections, talk about business and things, ways to move the sector forward. Our theme for this month, unraveling the true cost of electricity, as you may be aware, there's a, an ongoing polemic on um, the best fuel source that offers the best value for Nigeria. There have also been questions about the place of coal in power generation with enough advocates you know, who claim it's dirty and we shouldn't use it, while we have an equally vocal group you know, that claims that we need it uh, for development. Today's session should provide a different and quite compelling um, perspective to this debate. Furthermore, we hope to use today's uh, discussion to address other critical questions. Where would Nigeria get best value for investments in the power generation? Is it gas, coal, hydro, biomass, or what have you? What's the global trend um, in terms of investment in the power sector? What are factors driving this trend? What does Nigeria need to do to align with these uh, factors and trend? Which energy mix provides lasting benefits to Nigeria as the world moves towards cleaner energy sources? How do diesel generators compare with off-grid uh, renewables? And which is cheaper? I mean, I've gotten this question many times. Which is cheaper, one megawatt of gas power to one megawatt of coal? We're able to discuss these issues today, supported with empirical facts, because the Heinrich Boll Foundation and the Nigeria Economic Summit Group worked on a report that provides real answers to these questions. And we hope you picked up a copy um, of the report as you signed in. In a few minutes, I'll invite the panelists, Dr. Felix Mathis and Nana Ude, they will both have a few minutes to present their opening remarks, and then we'll engage in a moderated discussion followed by uh, interaction with the audience. Permit me to introduce the first panelist, Dr. Felix Mathis. He's a research coordinator on energy and climate policy at the 
Institute in Germany. I know I messed that up. He'll, he'll fix it when he gets here. He's the author of The Current Electricity Costs of Energy Intensive Industries in Germany and also author of The Blueprint Germany, a strategy for climate safe 2050, decarbonization strategy for Germany until 2050. He's a member of the European Commission Directorate General for Energy Advisory Group on the Energy Roadmap 2050 and guest lecturer on energy policy analysis at the Free University of Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Dr. Felix as he approaches the podium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure. It's a great honor to be here. It has been a long day, starting with the uh, Good Morning Show and the TV, and then having a quite successful event with the acting president. And now we go, we phase out the day uh, in a very nice environment. Uh, however, on energy policy. When I was invited here uh, to talk about international experiences, global experiences, I asked the organizers what is the value added uh, that uh, somebody who is, uh, who is honestly not familiar with, with many Nigerian circumstances, what is, what is the value added I could provide? And they said, okay, it, it is in the end of the day a national policy, it's a national industry, but to develop the framework and the regulatory arrangements for this sector, it sometimes has some value to look abroad. What have been the major trends? Where are we situated against these major trends? What are the international experiences? And I guarantee that's always valuable. And one of these international experiences is the reason, therefore, that I stand here without wearing a tie, I just come back from, from Japan and in, in Japan the government has asked the civil servants not longer to wear a tie or a jacket to increase the temperature of the air conditioning installations by 2 centigrade <laughs> and, to, and to save a lot of electricity and to save a lot of cost and so not wearing a tie has an opportunity benefit in terms of saved electricity costs. And so, uh, so I never thought about this. Uh, by the way, for all of you who are interested in the dress code is called cool biz. So, uh, so we're cool biz. That's the, that's the way forward, that's the future. But anyway, I think the first uh, interesting development, if you have a look on the numbers, on a global scale, last year in the world, there have been 75 gigawatts PV installed more than 50 gigawatts of wind and the net uh, capacity additions uh, in terms of coal and gas have been less than 40 gigawatts. And if you uh, draw this line, then there is a very clear upward trend for solar and wind and there is there's a very clear downward trend for coal and gas. And I think this is, uh, this is a general trend and we will see much more of this. And even in my country, in Germany, we have installed last year a bit less than two gigawatts of PV and four gigawatts of, 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 of wind. And if you compare these numbers with your national targets, then, uh, then this, uh, the, you see that probably uh, much more can be done. And one of the reasons and one of the drivers for these developments have been the cost. So we have seen 80% uh, cost reductions if it comes to solar PV. We have seen 20% cost reduction if it comes to onshore wind. And in Europe, we have seen more than 40% cost reductions of offshore wind power generation. And I think this uh, levelized uh, cost of energy. Uh, these uh, uh, are the costs which are relevant to an economy or to the, to the society and these costs do not uh, necessarily translate directly into business models. But there are interesting results. Uh, uh, I had uh, a 
originally prepared a presentation for today with a map on it, which shows the last uh, clearing prices of renewables tenders worldwide or from PPAs. And uh, so we are obviously uh, uh, able uh, to buy utility scale PV at the moment between three and five cents, euro cents per kilowatt hour in the US, uh, in, 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 in sunny countries, but even in my country, which is a very dark, which is a very cold country, is 1,000 hours of sunshine a year, uh, our auctions clear at the moment at six euro cents per kilowatt hour for sun. Uh, if, it comes to, if it comes to wind, it's even more impressive. The world record holder for the cheapest wind project uh, is at the moment held by Morocco. The last auction there cleared at 2.6 euro cent per kilowatt hour for a wind farm. And so you can see these, these are pretty competitive costs. If you assume that the, uh, the, life, uh, the levelized cost of energy for, for the usual, uh, the usual uh, conventional power plants are probably at five, six, seven euro cents, uh, depending on if you have, a, if you have to pay uh, um, uh, no price on, car on carbon, if you have to pay a price on carbon in many OECD countries, this is the case. Uh, this, it's even higher. And if it comes to nuclear, we have, we have the, uh, the, uh, the contract for difference in the UK, uh, or at the moment, uh, 11 euro cents per kilowatt hour of over 35 years. And so there is a certain uh, driver which, or, it, or this trend comes back to the costs. And so you could ask the question, the technology is there, 75 gigawatts, Installment last uh, installations last year. This is a significant number. Uh, there is there is everything there. The question is who owns the value chain, and what uh, what parts of the value chain can be implemented domestically or uh, globally. And in the, in the end of the day, the Chinese can deliver it all. Uh, the question is uh, if uh, is there any movement? Is there any ambition to get? Uh, bigger shares of the of the value chain uh, to uh, to uh, to a country, and you will be able to do this if you if you embark on this process early, and uh, be in front runner instead of a late comer, because the late comers uh, will uh, will won't have any chance to settle down significant parts of the of the value chain domestically. However, what are the real challenges? And the real challenges reflect somehow issues which, from my perspective, are also interesting or relevant to, uh, to Nigeria. The real challenge is not the technology. The real challenge is not the technology and the cost. The real challenge is structural change. And their policy comes into play. The key, proper, the, the, key, the key challenge of this, of this, uh, this uh, uh, trend, of this journey towards a renewable energy system is managing structural change. And therefore, you need, you, need, you need a policy framework. Because the world is as it is, we have a history, and all the regulatory frameworks we have have been designed to deal with the old world. And the question is, could you at least step by step adjust the regulatory and the market frameworks in a way that uh, also these new technologies with their new characteristics and new specifics can, uh, can, uh, can be boosted by this. And I think there are four, four different dimensions of structural change. The first is the nature of the technology differs. So, we, uh, so the many of these renewable energy sources are variable so they produce much electricity as the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. And if it's dark and if there's no wind, they don't produce anything. So, the, so these, these technologies are variable. So they need complements. Might be storage, might be gas turbines or flexible demand. Interesting, interesting uh, uh, case study is from my country where we have in between a lot of wind and a, a lot of solar there in this country, aluminium smelters start to redesign 
their production facilities that they can benefit from the cheap electricity if the wind is blowing and the sun is shining and that they can, can reduce production during times when there is no wind and no solar. But it, that means even demand side flexibility is an option to deal with this, this system. The second technical feature which is, which, is, which is significantly different, it is much more decentralized. It's much more dis distributed and that has implications for market arrangements, for market players, for infrastructures. I will come back to this later. So, this, so the, 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 the new world does not longer consist of uh, base load, medium load, peak load, and horizontally structured electricity system. It's more vertically structured. High load, low load, much wind, less wind, much sun, less sun, etc., etc. The second structural change is, re is related to cost. Uh, the interesting point is that the levelized cost of energy are somehow comparable or even even competitive uh, to uh, to uh, to the old systems. However, the structure of the cost is different. So it's a, it is a capital intensive system where at least 80 percent, 90 percent of the generation costs are capital costs. And there are good news and bad news. The good news is this system is not longer vulnerable to uh, volatile energy prices in the coal markets, in the oil markets, etc., etc. The bad news is you need to finance higher capital costs. And there are implications because the system uh, needs to recover their high fixed costs in a different way. And you all have in your pocket the blueprint for this, because what this future system looks like is exactly this. The short-term marginal cost of an additional telephone minute is zero. And therefore, the whole system can only pay back the investments via flat rates. And we are embarking in a process where if wind and solar have no short-term marginal cost, the whole system will be based on mechanisms which are much more comparable to flat rates or capacity payments than the usual selling kilowatt hours that we have seen uh, in the past. The third structural change is the diversity of the market participants or the operators and the investors in the system. My country, we have a long history of electrification, not to compare with Nigeria. We ran our electricity system for 100 years based on 300 to 500 large generation units. That has been the system. Uh, you, they have been able to, uh, to, to coordinate the system in emergency by phone calls. As of summer 2015, we had in my country 1.5 million installations if it comes to PV, 30,000 wind, uh, windmills, 30,000 uh, biogas plants, etc., etc. So in total, we are running a system that, that 15 years ago consisted of 500 plants. We are running now a system uh, uh, that is based on two, million, on 2 million generators. And we are today at 35% renewables in the system. Uh, if we want to go for 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, we will uh, need to coordinate a system of 10, of 10, 20, 30 million generators. And the key question is what is the mechanism to coordinate such system? And the, only, and the only answer to this is you need a functioning market because price signals will be the only mechanism that can coordinate this, the, uh, this, type, of, this, type, this type of market. And so the markets have not longer only the function to pay back for investments, they also and increasingly have the function to coordinate a highly diverse system. The second interesting point of these changing structures in terms of market participants or contributors to the system is that a significant share of the electricity generation changes its nature. It is shifting from the old world of investment goods, where you calculate net present value and make a strictly economic and financial appraisal, to a 
a consumption good. Because this is something like buying a car or something like this. I just built a new house in Berlin and uh, honestly, the bathroom equipment was more expensive than the PV on the roof. And so I never thought about to make a calculation of net present value. That is a consumption good. And the question is how the system works if let's say 25% of the investors don't longer follow the typical historical uh, uh, nitty-gritty investment good appraisals. And that's, that's, changing, that's changing the nature of the system. And the last interesting point in terms of market participants is that the old players do play a much smaller role. So in our good old world, in my country, 80% of the firm capacity here has, has, has owned by five giant utilities, and then we had a lot of municipal utilities which owned the remaining 20%. If you have a look on the, uh, on the statistical data, on the ownership of the renewables, then the five big utilities, they own 80% of the old capacity, now own 5% of the renewable capacity. The, uh, the municipal utilities who own 20% of the, of the conventional capacity, they own another 7%. That means 88% of the installed renewable capacity is owned by individuals, by farmers, by industries, by banks or others. That is shaking totally, number one, the electricity system, but number two, also the political system. Approximately 11% of the renewable capacity in my country is owned by farmers. Uh, and I think this is an important thing uh, to reflect politically. Because farmers are conservative people, at least in my country. They never will vote for social democrats, they will never will vote for greens, they always will vote for the conservatives. But after 11% of the renewable capacity is owned by farmers, even for the conservative parties, it's not that easy to escape from a trajectory to increase renewables. Because a significant part of their constituency has embarked on this way. And I think this is an, this is an important point uh, in, if, if, it comes, if it comes to policies. So it is about uh, diversity, not only in technologies, it's also about the diversity in market participants. And uh, this tables the issue on an accountable market framework and an accountable governance framework, which makes it possible for these non-specialized, non-traditional investors to enter the market. The fourth and last, but not least, structural change is the infrastructure. Uh, obviously, the spatial patterns of power generation change. They got much more diverse uh, over the country, so usually the energy production is, is concentrated at hotspots, and now it's much more evenly distributed ac uh, across the countries, and the nature of the infrastructure changes. Number one, uh, we, have an in, we, we have an interesting and important debate on transmission capacities because the most favorable uh, locations for wind power are in regions where there is no load and therefore you need transmission. But, and that's, the, that's somehow fitting into the old development. But, this, but the more interesting uh, change is the nature of distribution grids. Today distribution, grips, uh, today, distribution grids are, are designed for transporting electrons from, from A to B. That's the usual design feature. The new design feature is to collect electrons from many, many different producers and distribute these electrons to many, many different uh, uh, consumers. That means they increasingly get the role or the function of a collector. They are collecting something rather than transporting something. 
And we have an increasing role of self-consumption and mini-grid and micro-grids, which are interesting, interesting elements, not easy to handle, uh, but of, 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 of significant importance. Uh, and increasingly, these, uh, these distribution grids and the mini-grids and the micro-grids are smart. Uh, because they, they need to have flexible demand, they need to uh, how, somehow build technical bases uh, for, uh, for market structures. And so uh, what we see is that especially in the decentralized distribution grids and, and the mini grids and the micro grids, we see increasingly emerging of information uh, grids and information technology and electricity grids. So digitalization uh, is one of the key drivers of this of all these, of all these uh, more decentralized structures. And the key issue is, again, how or is policy able to adjust the regulatory framework and the market framework to this new world? And it is about hardware, infrastructures, but there is also the need to develop what I call the non-technical infrastructure because uh, to develop a certain amount and a, uh, the critical mass of these new generation and storage technologies, you need a lot of services. You need planners, you need designers, you need engineers, you need accountants, you need lawyers, you need bank bankers who are fam familiar with this. And so the crucial phase for my country at least was from 2000 to 2010 when we had a pretty generous feed-in tariff which, which, which pushed in the first gigawatts of, of renewables, but one of the ancillary benefits from this initial phase have been that the non-technical infrastructure was developed. And so that it is nothing unusual uh, for a bank to, to, to finance an investment in a PV installation. So uh, when we started into this journey, uh, the, that was a complicated technical application. Today they finance the PV installation like they finance a car. So and this technical, non-technical infrastructure needs to be developed and that is an important challenge, an important task for a first phase of penetration uh, of renewables into the system. And uh, I think at least the, uh, the experience we made, and that's my last remark, after the first 10 percentage points, there is a dynamic in place which drives the process even if the, if the remuneration framework is less generous, if you then change to tenders, whatever else. Because the infrastructure is there, uh, the product is, an, is a known product, and the non-technical infrastructure and the technical infrastructure allows for an accelerated phase-in of, uh, of renewables in, in the energy system. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Felix, for taking us on that journey on what's happening globally, you know, the trends. Um, to kind of recap, what I heard him say is uh, there's a global move towards renewable energy uh, in terms of investments in capacity by uh, players in the sector. Technology and cost are not the core challenges, rather it's how do we manage the structural challenges in, in the sector. And he went on to talk about about five of those, four or five of those uh, structural challenges. The one that really got me excited was uh, that in Germany, at least, there's been a move away from the traditional uh, companies that pr produce the, or generate power to a system where over two million um, power generating units, and this includes individuals who've installed PVs in their homes. And um, in a moment of uh, light reflection, I said to him that we're also doing as well in Nigeria because, you know, we've got many of us as uh, power, power generators as well. <laughs> um, but that also raises uh, certain challenges, especially for the regulator. You know, how do you regulate an environment where you have you know, power generation coming from different points, feeding into a network? You know, how do you coordinate um, all of that? The other question it raises is, 
in an environment where the distribution companies feel that by buying these distribution assets, they now own the geographic locations? How do you introduce new players, players who we might not even know what they look like today? You know, so um, the new NEC commissioners uh, have their work cut out for them. Another round of applause for Dr. Felix. It's a pleasure to invite Nana Ude, who's the founding partner and CEO of Argon Continental. It's an infrastructure advisory firm. He's an infrastructure policy expert at the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. He's the project lead on comparisons of costs of electricity generation in Nigeria. He facilitates, or the facilitator for the NESG roundtable on steady and adequate gas supply to the NIPP plants. He's a member of the Technical Advisory Committee of the National Assembly, where he has made input on a number of infrastructure reform bills. Nana will approach the podium and present on analyzing the true cost of each of the energy sources. A round of applause for Nana Ude. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, good evening, everybody. When Felix started, he said he has had a long day. I would rather say I've had a long week or a long month. Um, I went to bed yesterday by midnight and by 2 a.m. I was up again because we had this round table at the State House. And the significant thing about that round table was that we wanted to elevate the conversation on renewable energy to the level of the presidency. And we did that today for the first time in Nigeria. <laughs> and one of the reasons we decided to do that was we found out that it, the narrative around renewable energy, even though Felix has said that technology is not the challenge, cost is not the challenge. But for us uh, in the NESG, uh, which is a private sector think tank, we realized that the narrative was actually running around cost. Each time you want to discuss renewable energy on a, a, a large scale, you are always blackmailed with the point that uh, it's, it's too expensive. We can't talk about that now. Why don't you forget about that and let's focus on the energy source that we know. And uh, when I talk about renewable energy, of course, I don't, I won't include hydro at this point uh, because we, our on grid power generation capacity for hydro is about 14% and um, natural gas, which we all rely on mostly, is about 86%. That's for on grid. Whereas uh, in off grid, uh, Patrick said earlier on here now that um, we are all power generators. And um, the major source of off-grid power in Nigeria is diesel and petrol generators. Uh, the NDC 2016 figure projects that we have 16 million generators in Nigeria as we speak. And the, what that means is that we generate more electricity than we even feed into the grid in Nigeria. And so in order to confront the the question of cost. We in NESG decided to collaborate with Henrich Ball Foundation to actually do a cost comparison study of the generation, electric generation sources in Nigeria. You have the reports and uh, because Patrick insists that we should try to unravel the numbers behind this cost, uh, you will ultimately read the report when you go home, but I'm going to point at some of the figures that it, uh, we generated out of that. But let me also make this point clear. Uh, one, we relied essentially on Nigerian data from Nigerian sources and then applied international best practices in doing the data analytics. And the cost you are going to see uh, in two parts. We first calculated the investors' costs, the, uh, the levelized cost of electricity, LCOE. And then we then did what has not been done in Nigeria before we then applied the SCOE, the society cost of electricity, social cost, we applied external cost to it to find out now what is the true cost of generating electricity in Nigeria. Because globally, 
these practices, what is obtainable globally. But in Nigeria, we tend to box ourselves into the, just the LCOE investors cost um, uh, analysis. And so we decided to undertake this. And to, uh, to do that, what, what, what do you do? The, 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 over the last decade, monetary values have been used to express these external costs and the benefits of generation. And um, we, the, we used in, uh, global standards and then used $40 per ton of CO2 equivalent. We used $60 and then we used $100. And so I'm going to point at the numbers now. Um, for the LCOE on grid, where our study, in term, I'm now going to reel out a few numbers that you'll find in your report. So the, with the LCOE, our report indicates that the most competitive actually is large-scale hydropower and natural gas, and I mean combined cycle gas turbines. The costs were, uh, were between 5 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, with natural gas, yeah, we realize that the, it has low capital cost, but also the fuel cost, the cost of the resource itself, is about 60% of this LCOE, and note that it's also vulnerable to the volatile gas prices. And you will, in the report, realize that there is a considerable difference between the government-regulated price of $3.80 uh, per million BTU compared with the market reflective price of seven dollars uh, per million BTU. The next competitive one is onshore wind. Uh, the figures we had was an average of nine cents per kilowatt hour, even though uh, the, the higher boundary is about 14 cents per kilowatt hour. For coal, the data, the study we did put the figure at 10 cents per kilowatt hour to generate coal, uh, to generate power from coal. But significant costs that are not included include the capital expenditure to build the roads to transport the coal, the cost of infrastructure needed to transport the coal plant, and then of course the availability of the fuel itself. I'm still talking about LCOE now. When we go to LCOE, the dynamics will change. And then the final one is uh, the solar PV. Uh, unfortunately for us, right, we, we don't have um, a utility scale electric generation through PVs, but just last year, 14 solar PV companies signed PPAs at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour with NBET. And so that can give you, give, that gave us a rough estimate as to what the figures are pointing at. But like Felix pointed out globally, the average LCOE of utility scale solar PV fell by 60% between 2010 and 2015. And according to Bloomberg, the utility scale PV broke even with coal-based generating in 2016. This is quite interesting. And so one of the things we discovered in the study that we did was that Nigeria PV investments, even though they share the same risks as other power generation investments, but it is not vulnerable to the fuel price volatility associated with uh, fossil fuel or the resource depletion that also comes with using other fuel sources. That's for on-grid, LCOE. For off-grid, the divide is between solar PV and our diesel and petrol generators. And um, the study that we did, even though the small hydro, of course, uh, indicated that they were the most competitive when it comes to uh, on-grid. But with regards to solar PV, the cost that we got out of our data is 20 cents per kilowatt hour for solar PV, 30 cents per kilowatt hour for diesel, and 60 cents per kilowatt hour for petrol generators. Now, SEOE, and it's, it's important, uh, I would take out a minute or two to talk about this SEOE because that for me reflects the true cost of electricity. 
it's so easy for us to focus on the LCOE and the investors' cost. Uh, and if you have, if you, if you have witnessed the impact of generating power from sources such as coal within the environment, you will not so easily discard the concept of the SCOE when we talk about the environmental damage. T take a place like Otobo in Kogi State. They have lost the water in the community. They can't fetch their water anymore from the stream because of what mining has done. And then, of course, unless you are Donald Trump, you will also realize that climate change is real. Only Donald Trump believes that it is pure fiction. But that, that's fallacy. And so these, all of these feed into the true cost of generating electricity. And the earlier we begin to discuss it in Nigeria, the better for us. I've always made this argument that sometimes we, we tend to blackmail ourselves when we have this conversation around coal, renewable, by saying that, oh well, the Europeans are tormenting us with this argument. They have industrialized with coal. Why don't they allow us to industrialize with our coal? And then we can begin to discuss climate change. And I like to offer a counter-narrative as an African. Uh, if you go to a typical African village and you see the richest man in that village and someone tells you, and I'm sure most of us who are Africans here know that this story is, is common uh, around the villages and even the towns. And you see the richest man in the village and someone tells you that, ah, he had to sacrifice his son to be very rich. And then you go and say, okay, well, let me go and sacrifice my own son and be as rich as he is, and then we can begin to discuss who is richer than the other. And that it's, for me, it's that simple. We, we cannot continue to look at this cost as cost manufactured by Europeans or Americans, which is why I was... Um, Excited, last month, I gave this example this morning at the State House. Last month, at the World Economic Forum on Africa in Durban, the president of Senegal, Macky Sall, said that by 2021, Senegal will stop investments in coal and begin to focus on renewable energy. That's Senegal. It's no longer Germany. It's not about what the, the West want. That's the reality speaking to us here. And that's a realization of what the true cost is. And so what do the numbers tell us as it relates to SCOE? Like I said earlier on, we had them in back. We did the $40 per ton of CO2 equivalent. We did $60 and we did 100 With $40, the cost for PV, 10 cents, coal, 15 cents, gas, combined cycle gas turbine, 7 cents, wind, less than 10 cents, $60, PV remained at 10 cents, because what, PV remained at 10 cents, coal moved up 15 to 20 cents, gas, 7 cents, wind, less than 10 cents. At 100, PV remained at 10 cents. Coal shot further up to 20, 20 to 25 cents. Gas, less, more than 10 cents. And wind, less than 10. Now, why did PV and wind remain? It's because the society costs associated with them remain as they are, unlike the impact of coal and gas. But one interesting thing in it is this, that you notice when I said $100, at that point, PV became more competitive than gas. And so I will conclude by saying that 
in the time it takes to build a coal power plant in Nigeria, which is four years, the average investor's cost of utility scale PV would have dropped low enough to undercut the price of coal generation. And wind would even be more competitive. When you add the external costs, by 2025, solar PV will become competitive with gas. And even the less fancied concentrated solar power, CSP, will be able to compete with coal. I hope these numbers tell us a story. And then that's where I come to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nana, for that presentation. At least now we have some Nigeria numbers uh, that we can use in, in discussions and policy. But just to ensure that we all understand the concept we're discussing, if you can take another 30 seconds just to explain what goes into calculating the levelized cost of just a few of the points. Um, and the society cost of electricity, just so we see the difference. The, the levelized cost uh, is a standard formula uh, that has been developed over time. There are a few of the different ones, but there is an acceptable formula that calculates the levelized cost. So cost of fuel, yes, fuel, cost of fuel operating costs. Operating costs have been, it okay. all fits into that, uh, the, that. So, but the society cost, like I said, captures the cost to the environment, uh, climate change, uh, c impact on health, and all of that. And like I said, we, o over time, the, the monetary value has now been coded into the tonnage of equivalent, CO2 equivalent. Mm -hmm. That's how you arrive at the monetary value to do, input into that. Let me push this argument a bit further, right? Let me play a bit of a uh, devil's advocate. The West developed on coal. At the time they were developing, they conveniently forgot how to calculate the society cost of electricity. Now that they are developed, they're saying to us to completely forget some large natural resource we have in Kogi, Enugu, and around, and focus on solar. Someone, not me, might argue that this could be a grand design to stop us from developing. I hear your analogy of the rich man and the sacrifice. But in this case, if there is any destruction to the environment, we will all suffer it globally. If there's global warming, it's not going to happen just here, it will happen everywhere. We'll share in it. If the stream in Okubo is you know, polluted, we sink boreholes for them. You know, this could be some argument. What would be a good argument to convince these people who are dying in the wood, advocates of coal, that they're, they're backing up the wrong tree. Patrick, when I was growing up, there was this musical group called Arrested Development. The kind of argument that you have tried to explain is what I call arrested thinking, arrested innovation. It's not about what the West is telling us, really. It's about what the, not just what the facts are, but what science is telling us. It's about, if, I, I strongly believe that if the information available now were available in the 50s, the West will make different choices, the kind of choices they're making now. And so, for us to attempt to phrase this conversation around what they are telling us, rather than what we have discovered ourselves, 
if you go to Otobo, where coal mining activity is going now, I, I, I visited a coal mining site in Germany and saw the cost to decommission coal plants. The same waste we are talking about are spending money to decommission the coal plants. It's costing them money to do that. So, but if you go to a place like Otobo to see what coal mining is doing to local villagers who do not know these arguments about West versus us, they are dying by the day. They, they don't have water anymore. They have to walk long distances to get clean water. It, it doesn't, the argument doesn't fall in line with what the West is saying or not. Dr. Felix, I wonder if you have uh, to frame the uh, a bit different because uh, it is not entirely true that the West developed because they had coal. They have based their industrial development on energies that has been cheap at the time. And this cheap energy has been in Western Europe coal, but if you look for, uh, to the United States, Tennessee Valley Authority, all these big hydro projects, they had cheap hydro energy. So they are built their industrialization on the energy sources which, were, uh, which they thought uh, are cheap on the longer term. And I think that's the essence of the argument. And therefore you should de-link somehow uh, the issue of what is the, what is the basis, the energy basis for industrialization or for development from specific fuels. And if you ask the same question today, what is the energy which is for the foreseeable future uh, robust and relatively cheap, then the answer which has been hydro in Tennessee Valley, which has been coal in Germany, probably solar or wind here, because this is, a, this is a robust, affordable source. And you always can say, okay, we have today, uh, coal is a bit cheaper. These are long-lived assets. And it, from my perspective, is an illusion that there will be during the lifetime of these long-lived assets, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, there will be no price on carbon. Even in Nigeria, sooner or later, there will be a price on carbon. And then you have based industrialization on a source which has been for a short period of time cheap, but then becomes volatile and expensive. And I would argue that a country which has limited resources can't afford to embark on a trajectory where the basis is slippery. So, and therefore, I think it's, it's important to think what is the projection for the next 20, 30, 40 years? Uh, what are the foreseeable technical and cost development? And then to give an answer what is cheap and what is not cheap and what is suitable to build a basis for, uh, for, for modernization, for industrialization. And I think, I, I, as a European, I always thought in these cold terms, and I lived, I lived two years in the United States at the MIT in Boston, and then I, I learned that there a lot of this industrialization not relied on coal. It relied on other energy sources, specifically hydro, because it's cheap. And that's the important element, not this, not this specific fuel. If, if we extend that discussion a little bit between gas and solar, for instance, um, from the report, gas is still cheaper than solar. Um, we need to make huge investments in gas infrastructure, not just for power, but also for export. And if some other folks have argued, why spend resources developing solar that is still more expensive than gas when we don't have enough to invest in gas. And if we have limitless quantities of gas, why are we not spending our investment dollars building out gas versus this discussion around giving waivers and 
all kinds of things to promote uh, solar. I wonder if you want to take a crack at that. Yeah, that it's an argument, but uh, you, you need to think about what is the lifetime of the infrastructure. Will be there a chance to build, uh, to, to use the infrastructure? And I have not that much an, uh, a problem with gas because it is flexible. It will adjust for a longer term. But this will probably not apply for coal, which is a pretty inflexible source. And what we see, at least in my country, all the coal based power generators go bankrupt at the moment uh, because because the solar PV uh, is is limiting the, uh, the, the, uh, the operational time and I think therefore this is an important this is an, uh, this is an important argument and the other argument is what happens if the gas prices again uh, uh, reach m much more significant levels then the power generation will be pretty pretty expensive and I think what, what, what I think is especially if it comes to development it's more important to, has, to have robust electricity prices than electricity prices that could under s certain circumstances be cheaper and we call this the quip principle know what you will pay mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think this is, an, this is the upside uh, of the capital intensive technologies because you know what you will pay uh, the downside is that uh, you have a problem with the interest rates and you need, you need to, to solve the problem with the, with, the, uh, with the financing. But again, the question is how is the balance between cheap or less cheap, the question is, what is what, uh, how these numbers change over time versus more robust prices versus volatile prices. And my personal view is, is that volatility is a much, or, uh, it, it needs to be seen as a much more significant vulnerability than uh, differences in electricity prices of 10 or 15 percent. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, let me just add a word. That, in addition to what uh, Felix has said, I also want us to realize that this discussion is around an energy mix. Uh, nobody is saying stop investing in gas, phase out gas, and then focus on renewable. We're talking about an energy mix that accommodates gas and accommodates renewables. That's one. Second point I also want to make is that the, the, the shared investment risk on renewables determined by geographical location. For instance, you, you can't, because the renewables are spread around geographical locations, you can't actually shut down that energy source. Uh, you have wind, you, can, you have solar, or hydro all spread around. And so that's another advantage that renewable brings, rather than when you bust gas pipelines or you hold a particular section of the country, then the entire uh, energy situation goes down. So that's another side of the argument, mm -hmm. why we need to have an energy mix that recognizes the broad spectrum of our energy requirements. Excellent. Um, we're going to open it up for contributions, but I think this is a good segue to uh, talk about a vision 30, 30, 30 um, and why that's important and why we should be hopeful that this time maybe we hit the mark. So, Nan, I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about yeah. what, what it means. Yeah. Oh, well, I think I had a chuckle when yeah, you yeah, said yeah, yeah, that. Too. <laughs> Some people will say they've come again with uh, one of these their visions. A anyway, a vision, for those who do not know, vision 30, 30, 30, we, we agreed to it at NACOP 2016. NACOP is the National Council on Power uh, in Kaduna last year. All it means is that Nigeria has decided to generate 30 gigawatts of elect 30 gigawatts or 30,000 megawatts, yeah. 30 gigawatts of electricity by 2030, out of which 30% will come from renewable energy. That's what the 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 vision. What's the path you see? You know, what's the, what's the ideal path and how can this new Nigerian Renewable Energy Roundtable help to realize this? Yeah, w w one of the reasons why we push to have this round, uh, Renewable Roundtable, because it's not, a, when we talk about the Roundtable, it's not an event. We, w have we want to create a platform, a multi-stakeholder platform, because if you were there this morning, there are still issues around what we need to do to achieve that 30 percent is one thing for government to make a pronouncement is one thing for a policy document to be reeled out or an action plan 
one of the things we found out was that there was no multi-stakeholder platform that brings in the policymakers, brings in private sector, brings in civil society to begin to discuss the action points. What do we need to do? What finance instruments can we leverage on to support renewable energy companies? What policy framework, regulatory framework that is required? All of that is what led us to now create this roundtable as a framework for this. So that's what the roundtable is about, to, sub to ensure that the 30, 30, 30, we deliver on it. Excellent. Okay, so we'll, we'll take some comments and questions before we take, I pose another round. Who's got the microphone? Someone in front here. Dr. K. Kechuku, MNI, Executive Director, Development Specs Academy. You know, the conversation about coal, I've been listening to the discussion to see them speak about the type of coal. I didn't hear that. Our coal is not one of the best. Much of uh, the West developed on coal, but it was anthracite coal the most efficient in terms of energy delivery, produces practically no smoke, environmental impact not too high, negatively. But the other point also is that if you do an aggregation of the use of that type of energy at the time, the population of the earth, the number of industries, you will notice that the impact was not significant enough to create alarm. Today, the story is different. So we can't ignore that fact. One, what type of coal? Two, extent of use. Thirdly, the possibility of going back to coal for us. Objectively, confirm what kind of coal we have. It's mostly bituminous with massive emission of the equivalent of the coal of the tire you use for your road, really. In fact, if you choose to extract petroleum from our coal, it will give you a much higher yield than coal in many other places. So while that excitement prevails, the truth of the matter from your experience is that the impact is real. And also, if you do a thorough cost-benefit analysis, it may not take us to pass. So the argument, oh, they used coal to develop, now they should allow us to do the same. After all, it's the same world we live in. They can't carry us too far. Because your neighbor climbed a tree with bare hands, Today, there's a possibility of using an elevator. You say, no, 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 come on. Have you forgotten <laughs> that 300 years ago, he used bare hands? This is not 300 years ago. The other point concerns the interventions. You know, not everybody here is a member of the NESG. Not everybody here is Felix. And I imagine that when one comes to events like this, one is supposed to walk away with some content of consciousness. How many people here know the meaning of SEO? I don't. We came to find out the cost of energy in simple terms. The people who spoke to us are technical people. There's nothing criminal in that. But they have a duty to leave us with some content of consciousness. And it was rather limited. I recall um, a recent event, I think it was NTA that organized it. I was on the panel with uh, the power minister. And he was trying to point out the problem of uh, why supplies, why we have challenges in electricity supply. And he went on and on that, you know, the problem is with the Jenkos. You know, when the Jenkos, the, the discos cannot pay the Jenkos, and so they cannot, and government is trying to find a way of making it possible for the Jenkos. And they I say, sorry, sir. If people carry a placard tomorrow that there's a man called Jenko who is responsible <laughs> for not getting power, will you be surprised? The truth of the matter, from experience, and then none of my good friend knows, I am averse to go to, I am a communication person, I am averse to inviting people and not, and leaving part of that audience, even if it's one person, feeling robbed. And I think next year has a duty in that regard, being that this is regular, to always distill outcomes. Communication to a wide audience of diverse background, most of them non-technical, 
requires that the communicator exercises the primary duty of distillation. You look for the LCM. We want, oh yes, LCM. Least common multiple. That, that's why I was going to give an example. <laughs> so when you use a technical expression, use an example. I tell you, I want us to solve all the sociocultural problems, sociopolitical problems of Nigeria. Some will understand it. And then I go on. What I mean is that I want us to solve all the problems that the small man, the big man, that way you're talking to us. Please. Very good. Mm -hmm. Sorry, very quickly, just to round up. Hydro. I'm sure Nana would advert, you want to advert your mind to the crisis of um, water supply. We now have close to 60% higher volume of dams and damming in the country than we had 20 years ago. Niger has lost 58% of its water volume. Now there's improved water supply because of the rains. Hydro is endangered because there's no control in the use of water resources. So at the end of the day, I ask myself, what's the takeaway? Is it gas? Possibly. But my argument would be, the gas that's being fled all over the country, fled, can generate electricity. And you're talking about millions of tons being fled every week. Whereas it's not a final solution. It's an intervention that could play the role. Those complainers saying that, um, what do you call it? Cool. Coal played for the West. So we're being delusional. When we focus on winning arguments instead of solving our everyday problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Valid points, I will come to respond to them. Um, comments, questions? There's one behind that. Good evening. My name is Dr. Binna. I'm not a power expert. I'm just a Nigerian who is concerned that we are still in darkness. So I came here tonight to hear the cost of having a list in my house which I've not had for so long a time. And I'm glad that Felix said that cost and technology are not issues for us globally now. And that sounds very good to me, which I also know before now. Because I'm sure that what we need to have light in Nigeria is available, technology-wise. I'm also sure that we have money to make it happen, money-wise. You may doubt that, but even if we don't have money in the budget, we have recovered loot. Which, if we work at, if what we recovered is true, we have billions of dollars recovered already. If we work at using these billions of dollars to give light to two cities of Nigeria, Abuja and Lagos, or Abuja and Kano, or just two cities, and give us light constantly for two years without interruption, that would be a lot easier to get light across this country. But over the past several years, we've been talking about lights, talking about one-point agendas, ten-point agendas, and nothing has really happened. I believe that rather than looking at coal, which we can go back to, looking at um, hydro, which may not suffer for a very long period of time, solar panels for me is actually one of the best options. But why it's so expensive right now is because very few people can afford it, and the use is not universal. But if we multiply solar panels in this country, if we begin to develop solar panels in this country significantly and provide panels to every school, every government institution, every home, the average cost of acquiring solar panels will come down significantly and this will give us a long-term solution. It, like you were talking about 2 million people providing power in Germany. In Texas, for instance, almost every home generates power by, by solar panel and feed it back to the government and government pays them back for it. That can be done in this country. What we just lack in this country is the will to do what is right and the vision to do what is needed. It's not money, it's not technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Maybe one or two more, then, yeah? Good evening. Uh, my name is Aliu from Vulal Global. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, as a Nigerian, obviously, NEPA is not working for me at the EPHN. Uh, but I've tried generators as well. I am looking so much into power, uh, um, solar power, but unfortunately, 80% of solar power, uh, the cost to have one in your home or in your institution is the batteries. And uh, what are 
the think tank organizations or bodies in Nigeria doing to promote the production or recycling of batteries in Nigeria so that they can make it easier and more affordable for everybody. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Dr. Motai Odairo. McKinsey, two weeks, months ago, said that at the moment, the world is doing about 40% coal energy mix and that it is not going to go down by 2030. They are looking that the best we are going to get at about 2040 will be 34% coal mix. South Africa does 68% of its energy on coal. India does 69% on coal. China does about 60, 67% on coal. And even when I looked at that one for Germany, the hard coal is 18%, the lignite is 17 The two put together is 35 England is doing about 25 Looking at this one, definitely my worry, I quite agree that coal will damage our environment beyond what we are imagining because Sorry. Mm -hmm. of the quality of coal that we have as at the moment. So I don't think that the option for us is coal. But my worry is that the gas turbines are manufactured abroad. The coal plants that we are talking about are not produced here. The hydro turbines are not produced here. The solar panels, the batteries we are talking about are not produced here. Our input is less than 5%. And we don't have the money to make this external purchase. So in the midst of what we have now, we talked about the gas, we have it in abundance. We don't have the technology to extract it and use. So what do we do in the situation that we are now? It looks extremely complex to me. Four gigawatts of electricity for 180 million people, while Germany is doing 79 giga, 80 gigawatts for 79 million people, or vice versa. Germany does almost one gigawatt of electricity for one million uh, population. Why we are doing four for 180. So, you see, by the time we look at this, it looks so confusing that I don't know that the tokenism is what we are still talking about with the 30 gigawatts that we are saying. Correct. South Africa, population 40 million people, they are doing almost, uh, almost 40 gigawatts. So, Thanks. honestly, I think we, the challenge is really enormous. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's take this comment and then we make some responses and take another round of questions. Uh, good evening, all. My name is Ali Yunusa, um, a staff of Empower. I strongly believe that um, the energy mix is the way out, truly. But um, we must also look at the political will to make it work. That is um, talking in terms of um, the roadmap in the implementation. And I also have a question regarding the privatization process of the power sector. It's rather disheartening that um, why privatize a monopolistic um, sector like the power sector? It really gets me really very confused. Unlike the communication sector where we have different players like the MTN, GLOW, and all that, it calls for competition. And I believe if there's competition in the sector, it makes, it makes it more efficient and cheaper. So really, we have to really look at um, the privatization sectors sure which gives um, the rise of maybe Jenkos and Menkos and Mr. Yeah, Jenko. all those we'll, we'll explain that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, take, we'll, we'll make some responses, but I think I saw Suleiman or Blue Camel somewhere. Okay, I'm going to come to you to answer the third question on cost of solar. Because Suleiman, who runs Blue Camel, has a luxury estate here in Abuja that is completely off-grid and runs 100% on solar. 
Um, so I'll have him provide answers to that question. But there were questions on what is LCOE, what is SCOE. Um, Observation. Okay. Uh, can okay. we can we go back? Yeah, but, but it, uh, even though he said it's an observation, I recall that when I was making my presentation, even though I referred to SUE, I used the simplified phrase investors' costs. And then when I talked about SUE, I also simplified it by using the phrase the social cost, the cost to the community. So I tried as much as possible to go away from so let's try it again let's try it again let's assume that we didn't get it right the first time what is the levelized cost of electricity i can attempt the levelized cost of electricity is what does it cost to produce one kilowatt hour for instance yeah it is the cost of that fuel, the fuel source you're starting with, coal, gas, hydro, biomass, wind, whatever, plus the cost of running your plant, the operating cost, plus all the other costs of doing business to produce this light coming out of the ball. The capital cost too. The capital cost. Yeah. So that's the, you need that levelized price to be able to compare the different sources to know which is better than the other and it's also in the document that was handed out after when you signed it okay now after doing those comparisons that's what nana spoke about that says that okay gas is still better than coal etc etc and he reeled out the numbers which are also in the document the second cost he talked about is the society's cost of electricity so what are the other costs to society for using either of these sources? The you know, pollution that happens, etc., etc. When you layer all of those costs, that on, is the on, true when cost. You layer it on the LCOE. When you layer LCOE it on the cost. levelized cost, yeah. yes. That is the true cost. Because we cannot afford to look at just the levelized cost. It, is not, it doesn't give us the full cost of a full cost analysis of whether coal is better than hydro, etc. So, yeah, that's, that's it. I so hope that's I hope uh, Dr. Ikechuku. <laughs> 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 okay, there was another question around yes. um, this conversation on costs. It is not an issue. L let me just make a point that why we in the NESG, and I need to clarify, you know, sometimes people think that. NESG is an arm of government. We are not. We are private sector. So don't throw your power crisis at us. We are like you, trying to solve them. So one of the reasons why we decided to do this study is that you will all agree with me that when we talk about investments into infrastructure, whether it is power or transportation, there is public sector investment, there is private sector investment. And all over the world, it's been proven that private sector investments have actually expanded or closed the infrastructure gap. And for us in NESG or the private sector, you won't have any conversation on investment without the numbers. What would the numbers say? If I decide to make an investment on this infrastructure for five years or ten years. So that's what enabled us to do this. And that's why, in addition to the roundtable, we have our CEO's business meeting on Thursday to present this course to the top CEOs who will hope to entice to then know that they can make investments in renewable energy. So I, that's the reason why we are discussing costs today. And I also agree with you that a lot still needs to be done to bring down the cost of solar PV. And we had conversations around that, not just today, but it's been an ongoing discussion. How do you decrease the investment? What kind of incentives do you provide? Uh, tax incentives, customs facilitation, zero duty, and all of that. So those discussions are going on with government, which is why we decided to step up and say, we can't continue to let government quote and unquote, deceive us with this plan, beautiful plan or beautiful vision, let's actually make them begin to work. And a lot has been said about coal here, and um, 
South Africa is doing 69%, India, China. I try to avoid having this conversation as a conversation against coal. It's not so much against coal, but for renewables. I always, even when we're working on this report, Christine will confirm this, I always kept making that point. Let's not make this a discussion against coal. Let's make it a discussion for renewables. And so we lay the cat on the table and let Nigerians know what the true cost of each generation source is. So I, I really struggle to go into that uh, uh, debate on why coal, why not that. Sure. Let's have a discussion on renewable, on renewable energy. And then when we talk about the political will to make it work, yes, we agree with you. If we felt there was a political will, we all would sit down. But because we knew that we also can be catalysts for that political will to come up. And today, uh, a lot of comments were made around the, the presence of the acting president and the commitments he has made. And we have decided to hold them to those commitments they have made to ensure that this is done. And that's why we all have to continue to get involved. Even when we are not all members of NESG, I've already described as a multi-stakeholder platform. And so there are going to be different sure. segments, different publics that will be represented in the roundtable to ensure that our voices are heard and actions are taken. Sure. Let, let me also respond to the question from behind um, as to, you know, how do we reduce the cost of PVs? You know, if government installed them in schools, hospitals, etc., that will bring down the cost. In fact, it might even incentivize some business people to set up local production. Well, a lot of advocacy around that is ongoing, and we're beginning to see some, you know, green shoots coming through. Number one, in the budget this year, government has made some commitment and put some money behind it to um, put solar, uh, install solar in about five universities and in some general hospitals. Nine, nine universities. Is it nine? Nine. Nine universities. Now, um, a few months ago, we had the Senate, the chairman of the Senate Committee on Power here. And we challenged him that if, if the National Assembly, for instance, put some of the constituency monies to uh, mini and micro grid projects that run off of renewable energy, that that could get power to the 100 million Nigerians who are not connected today and there is no hope of connecting them. But secondly, it will increase the capacity and make it possible for people to make some investments in that space. He then in turn challenged us to come back to him with a business case of sorts that he can present to his brother senators, uh, which we are working on today. Now, it's exciting because sometimes we, when we don't provide them with the information they need, their good intentions will not make it happen. You know, some of them have a good intention to make it happen, but they don't know what to do. And that's why some of the work NESG is doing the, this work I'm speaking about is being supported by Henry Boll as well. You know, we're hoping that all of those who push, um, at least incentivize them to do the right thing. There was a question on... Uh, sorry, let me also support what you've said. Uh, where you made a point that nearly 100 million Nigerians currently lack access to electricity. I think we need to take that very seriously. Uh, one of the points Felix made earlier on was about the, the multiplicity of generators that we have now in Germany. Our study has also proved that in Nigeria too, that is the situation. However, what we are now advocating is that, yeah, small is beautiful, but let it be clean. Yeah. And so we want to continue to scale up investments to ensure that we have 20, 30, 40 million Nigerians able to generate their own electricity, but clean energy. That's what we're talking about. I'll let Felix uh, respond, and then I'll go to Suleiman, who I now see in the back. Yeah, yeah for, first of all, I, I would again come back to the, to the cost of PV. I think there, there are different levers. The first is the world market will do its job, so the capital cost, so the, the cost of investment will go down. Uh, and so. This will be done uh, essentially by the world market it has, uh, as it has been done for the last years. But there are certain levers 
uh, where a domestic policy can have a major impact. The first is the high cost of financing. So I think the and what, what what one of the one of the issues which which explains a lot of the cost differences, for example, between Nigeria and India, is the interest rate. The cost cost of capital is part higher here because the macroeconomic situation, but there is also the, the dimension because, uh, for example, uh, the control of quality is different. So in my country, the warranty for a PV installation is 10 years. That's a story for a bank than if you have a warranty of one year. Yeah. And you can issue this warranty by state-governed quality control. I think this is, this is one, one key issue. The second is standardization. As long as many, many of these installations are tailor-made and not standardized, that it is a standardized product with a standardized contract, standardized uh, uh, financing agreement. So this standardization can bring down costs. And the third source is the, is, is the cost of, of maintenance. And there, there are maintenance costs, and these maintenance costs are significant. And also, these maintenance costs can be uh, can be improved by professional skills. Uh, and we have, we we also have made nasty experiences. But if there is this, let's say, this non this non you know what uh, the uh, the non technical infrastructure, and uh, I would say uh, you this all these elements can deliver between 15 and 20 percent of cost reduction but that can be done yeah uh, one last remark to, on the coal debate I'm not in a position to comment on the Nigerian debate here but I think to uh, 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 because this is a matter of fact number one you need to be very clear what the position of countries and investor is investors as to existing coal do we have a lot of coal in Germany yes do we have a lot of coal in, uh, in China? Yes. Are the investors happy with the economics of their coal plants? In Germany, no. In China, no. And so the question of the existing assets, where the, all the cost is sunk, is a different debate if you are going for new coal and where the money is not yet sunk. And I think you need to be very careful to differentiate these, these two debates. And my last remark would, uh, it is very difficult to be here as somebody in a country where the firm capacity is 100 gigawatt. If you recalculate this for the, for the population of Nigeria, so the firm capacity here would, be, would have to be 225 gigawatt, not 30, and so, so 225 uh, this year. But in the end of the day, on the, on the long term, there is a need to make huge investments in the power sector. Even if you only would reach 50, 60, 70, 100. The, the easy question is, will either coal or gas be able to deliver this enormous of capacities? And the answer is probably not. Because uh, it is about the size of the process, but also what is the what, is the, what are the sources of financing? And one of the interesting things with schools is that these are very modular projects which can be invested on a modular basis. And one of the surprising results in my country is that we used to uh, run the, all the system with the billion, billion euro investment for many years. When these renewables came into play, all the investment financing has been done by local saving banks, not by the big investment banks, by local saving banks because there is in there in the society. The question is if the size of the investments in certain in certain quantities which can be dealt with with different or channels. And I think and I think to use additional financing capabilities for this necessary rollout is an important thing. And therefore, I think the more modular the power capacity uh, uh, on is, the more realistic the financing is of this. 
Uh, and having said this, many from Nigeria to do this, but uh, you should reflect that uh, the, the model which should work, should work in the world of a 30 gigawatt target, but on the longer term also for the 100 or 200 gigawatt target, because that in the end of the day is, is it about. And uh, uh, I think we, we will see a major role of, uh, of electric mobility. What happens to the Nigerian electricity system if the global standard is electric cars? What does that mean? And so what are the capabilities to, to, to host such structural change? And I think it is about structural change and you need to reflect this. And if you only look back, then the answers uh, to solve the future problems are probably not the most sufficient. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Suleiman, there was a question on how do we make solar affordable, especially given the cost of batteries. So I wonder if you can quickly introduce yourself and you have like two, three minutes to do that. Okay, once again, my name is Suleiman Yusuf. We developed the first off-grid set of apartments in Nigeria. Um, it's a 10 units of apartments in Guzape here and it's been running totally off the grid for the past two years. Uh, we don't have a generator on that side. We don't have grid electricity on that side. And for the past two years, we've been living as conveniently as any Nigerian who runs air conditioners in his house, who runs electric ions and microwaves and all that, you can name it. It's a hybrid combination of wind and solar. And um, uh, the man who talked about cost of electricity, I appreciate his, stand his standpoint or his position. You know, looking at this flyer as an ordinary Nigerian, you're hoping to go back with something that you can go and probably start working on your budget and thinking of how you can provide yourself with electricity from solar. Uh, I'll give two different or three different scenarios here. Number one scenario, let's look at it from the standpoint of the solar panel itself. Let's assume that we go for a 300 watt solar panel, just one unit. What's the average cost of a 300 watt solar panel? It's about 60,000 Naira now. We have a bit higher grade. We have those that are even cheaper than this. But assuming we take the 60,000 Naira solar panel. How much, how much electricity can that provide? Very good. That's where I'm going to. Now, a 300 watt solar panel in an Abuja location, for example, where we have six sun hours in a day, means that it can give you 300 watts power for six hours every day. That is 1.2 kilowatt hour. Now, if you take 1.2 kilowatt hour, let's forget about storage, even though it, it's, uh, it's vital in our calculation, but just to understand the cost of the amount of power we can generate by X amount of Naira. If we have 1.2 kilowatt of electricity daily, in 10 years, we will be generating about 6,480 kilowatt hour from just one solar panel of 300 watts. And if you want to match that to the current cost of electricity, let's say um, the, 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 the estates, you know, where you pay 60, 66 Naira per kilowatt hour, you will have generated about 298,000 Naira worth of electricity from that 60,000 Naira worth of solar panel. And the last span of the solar panel is as long as 25 years. So you're talking about 745,000 Naira from the 60,000 Naira investment in solar PV. That's one scenario. On the second scenario, let's go back to the Guzape apartment. On the 10 apartments there, when I was looking for investors to invest on the power side, I presented the total uh, startup cost of that project, which was at 25 million Naira. And people was like, ah, am I crazy? How much does it cost to buy a generator? And how much would it cost you to keep powering it? You know, it seemed like a lot, but 25 million Naira investment uh, for 10 apartments, if you break that down, it's just about 2.5 million naira. That's probably less than the cost of tiling some houses that I've been to here in Abuja. So if that 2.5 million can solve your energy problem for the next 10, 15, 20 years, I don't think it's too expensive. Now we went ahead to do a business case and we considered the cost of you know, um, uh, maintenance and battery replacement over 10 years. And that came to about another 1 million naira. So we're looking at about 3.5 million naira per apartment. 
Now, what does that translate to your daily energy costs? That translates to about 970 naira daily per apartment. That's about 30,000 naira monthly. Comparing that to the grid electricity, let's not even bring generator. I think on the long run, this is going to be far cheaper. We worked out a 25 years analysis and we discovered that our cost of energy will be at about 13 naira per kilowatt hour. We're not talking about the likely cost of you know, the um, grid electricity, which is certainly going to keep going up. And we have not even brought in that inconvenience, the cost of powering generator, because even the grid is not there. And the cost of generator electricity is somewhere around between 60 to 80 naira per kilowatt hour. So if you were to bring that into the equation, I think your solar electric, uh, generation costs, you can break even within maybe four to five years. So I the real problem is the acquisition cost. Yes. The Over the lifetime of you know, solar and grid, it is clear that solar makes a whole lot of sense. Exactly. But, but the problem is the acquisition. Yes. Not only that, you know, when we talk about solar, most people think it's just about solar PVs and solar power generation. We don't look at solar thermal. We just did an analysis for an estate, a 3,000 uh, 3, unit uh, estate, and um, we looked at the cost of the energy required to power their water heaters over a period of 10 years, and you will not believe this. We got a figure that landed us at about 9.8 billion naira just for heating water to bat. 9.8 billion naira for 3,000 units of houses. We now looked at the other option of the solar thermal heaters, and it was going to cost us just 1.2 billion naira to install solar water heaters on the rooftop of each building times 3,000 units. That means that we're looking at an 80% cost saving over a period of 10 years. Again, it comes back to the question, where are you going to get that 1 billion from? <laughs> <laughs> But if you take it unit by unit, of course, even the, the regular water heaters is already in the range of 50,000 naira, and you're looking at the 150,000 naira solution. So I don't think, I think we need to start looking at these things much more closely than just um, being scared away by the total uh, initial cost. Excellent. Thank you so much for that uh, intervention. Okay. I thought my voice would carry. Please. Uh, being an expert in this, there's some useful information he might need to give. Part of the concern expressed by the man who spoke is that you install and after a short time it's all gone. Mm -hmm. And that's likely because I believe they use the wrong type of battery, isn't it? So is the gentleman here? Suleiman. Yeah, so that, yeah, so that he will advise because mm -hmm. we have the deep cycle battery which is appropriate for it. But what happens most of the time is that you procure the panels, they use car batteries, or trailer batteries, and in a couple of months, you're out. Some, yeah, we've experienced. It's not meant for that kind of story. Yeah. So I think we should take the advantage of his presence here for education on this. Clearly, he's using the right type of batteries. So let him just. Suleiman, if you can address that, and also address the fact of the bad conception people have of solar, given what we're seeing with the solar street lights and so on. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that interesting part. You see, the cost of battery bank alone, because the solar generates power for only maybe between four and six hours, depending on your location in Nigeria in a day. That means the bulk of the energy you can, you can generate from the solar has to be stored somewhere. Coincidentally, during the power generation, except for offices and factories, is when people don't need the power as much. They are at work. So they need a means of storing this power so that they can use them at the time of need. Unfortunately, the storage part of it is quite expensive, and that is what changes the equation. And the issue of batteries, like he asked, we have different kinds of batteries for different purposes. We have the tubular batteries, which can last up to seven years. But, you know, we really don't go for tubular batteries because most installations are indoors, inside people's houses, even in the kitchen, underneath the staircase, and they don't want that emission that comes out of tubular batteries. Otherwise, if we plan solar systems during building, then we will always make a provision for our battery bank outside the building. And we can go for tubular batteries, which can last as long as seven years. On the Guzape building, we're using tubular batteries there, among the midst of other batteries. Secondly, due to the cost of um, batteries, we have different options. We have the, uh, um, the, the um, uh, gel batteries, we have the valve-regulated lead-acid batteries, and even, even amongst these batteries, 
you know, they have, they all come with their technical data sheet. So most of our installers don't have the knowledge to understand how these batteries work. The lifespan of a battery is a function of the depth of discharge of that battery and the frequency of discharge. So if you install a system and you allow your battery to deplete to 40%, which is the minimum all the time, then that battery will be short-lived. Probably after one year, the battery will be gone. The same battery, if installed under the right environment and design, could give you three or four years if you reduce your depth of discharge to 60 or 70%. But it still boils down to the initial cost. If a customer can run four hours, which is what he needs, on two batteries, and you ask him to buy four batteries and run four hours, he will not understand that you're trying to make his replacement time much longer by you know, in building up the battery bank and doing it less, uh, having less depth of discharge. But on the overall, I think the, the game is changing. Before now, people didn't research into, you know, have all kinds of people who just, you know, um, of course, we're all aware of the unemployment situation in the country, so it felt like an opportunity for people to make a quick one, especially capitalizing on the power situation. So we had all kinds of people in the industry, you know, but things are changing, you know, there is a lot more research now, there's a lot sure. more knowledge, there's a lot mm. more training, and, you know, that issue of battery bank, if you want to buy a battery, I can tell you exactly how many years X battery will last you, and how sure. many years Y battery will last you, all depending on your budget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lehman. Um, there was a question here on competition in the power space. Um, I also alluded to it in, when I was talking about how the distribution companies view um, their geographic location. But just to say that the Honorable Minister, I think about two weeks ago, uh, made a pronouncement on eligible customers. What that means, Dr. K. K. Chuku, is that if you, if you use large amounts of power, you can buy your power directly from a generating company. What that then means is that the distribution companies will have to compete for your business. So that's a way of introducing competition in a market. The privatization process, um, I, I think the way to look at it is at the point, the key priority was to get the assets out of the hands of government. Now there are lots of other things that need to happen to make the market very competitive. Again, we're still in that transitional electricity market, and by the time we go to a market where it's contracts, etc., that lead, uh, drive the market, it will get a bit more competitive. Um, let's take a few more questions. I think we've got about 20 minutes to go. Another round of questions, and so here. G. Aditun G. Romini, Solar Centric Technologies. You ran a campaign recently on cost of energy. How much are we willing to pay? Mm -hmm. I'm, I was thinking that would most likely be one of the first things to be communicated and then debated on. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of concern. Mm -hmm. Consumers don't want to pay. The discos, or should I say the power sector players are saying, we are not cost reflective in terms of our services. You and I know that very well. Mm -hmm. And to buttress some of the points that um, Yusuf has made, I, I wish they had responded to that question very, very clearly in terms of if you have requested for, let's say, a 5 kilowatt system with backup, how much it comes down to in terms of CAPEX and then OPEX going forward. Because people really need to know. Uh, very clearly, if you're running your diesel generator, um, now, let me not talk about the recent development that NMPC crashed price of diesel by 42%. So the prevailing rate of, let's say, about 200 naira per liter, you are definitely generating a kilowatt hour of energy from between 62 Naira to 97 Naira. We need to have that at the back of our mind. The more you're running your diesel generator, that is how much you are spending. But to pay less than 30 Naira per kilo hour to the discos, you and I don't want to do it. They are saying they want increment. So I was, you know, like having a lot of waves over my head about how we really need to communicate it sure. to the people to begin to understand that, look, the power sector, unfortunately, has been privatized. It's no longer pro government property. How prepared are you and I to actually afford their services or utilize their services? That's the way I continue to like at, look at it. Okay. I play heavily in the commercial and industrial sector. 
and there's a lot of engagement going on back and forth. It's not going to be easy, but I think there's been a lot of traction over the years. Thank Let, you. Let's take a comment from Shegu, but let me s respond quickly to the point you made. Yes, we ran a questionnaire on how much people are willing to pay for power. We're still getting responses, and that's why we haven't published the results yet. But just preliminary um, numbers we're seeing is very interesting. Um, let's not preempt it. Uh, let's get the data in, and then we'll, we'll, we'll advise here. Yeah. All right, thank you. My name is Shagun Adaju. I represent the Renewable Energy Association of Nigeria. Uh, I'd just like to address, uh, make a comment about the issue of costs, uh, the initial capital that you require to adopt renewable energy. Because I think it's one of the major uh, issues that we have mm -hmm. to ensure people, I mean, to get people to adopt. Uh, I've seen what some other countries have done, and three areas that I probably feel we can adopt in Nigeria, and maybe the round tables we also begin to focus on. Number one, um, the first thing is to try and create a financing framework. Okay, so how can people lease solar? How can I buy solar now at a very low price and pay over time, just like a mortgage? Uh, India started by uh, setting up uh, what we call the Indian Renewable Energy Development Agency that provided a guarantee to financial institutions so that they can lend to end users and they can pay over time with a guarantee. I think Bangladesh did the same and they called it an uh, infrastructure development company of, uh, I mean, company limited of Bangladesh. It's a, it's a possibility for Nigeria to consider, um, I mean, maybe when we're talking to the regulators, sure. to have a CBN the Bank of Industry, have that kind of a framework. Because that's the initial capital that is needed to make commercial finance come into yes, it. Yes. If development finance doesn't come, banks will not go into it. The second is what I've also seen where we have what we call the net metering. Um, for example, I mean, I have a four kilowatt solution in my home in Lagos. So in the daytime when everybody's, my kids are going to school, I've gone to work, and I've generated extra energy, my battery is fully charged, the excess is wasted. I don't get paid for it. So if there's net metering, and I, can, I know that I can earn some Naira from that insulation, you'll be shocked at the number of Nigerians that will put panel on their rooftops. Correct. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to earn money. That's the second. Mm -hmm. And the third um, has also been, for example, in countries in Europe, like Germany and the rest, where they have created incentives for individuals, businesses to also adopt solar. So they get tax break. I mean, they get tax rebates. Um, they get some incentives for putting solar on their roof. Sure. That might be yeah. some of those things that we need to begin to talk Excellent. about. Excellent. Let's take the last comment because we are almost running out of time. Um, but a quick response to you, Shegu. If you recall the event we had here with the minister in January, we spoke about net metering, and he gave certain commitments that is something that will be considered, but at the time, we didn't have net commissioners in place. So now that we have net commissioners in place, it's one of the things you know, that they, they're, they're going to consider. Yeah. Hello. Good evening. My name is Olisa from Serengeti.ng. Um, I think for educational purposes, we should act Olaji Suleiman. I've designed um, off-grid systems using Homer 2 with GIZ. I think I saw Carlos the last time. And if, if you can produce power, renewable energy, and you're able to pay back in 4.5 Yes, I think it's very good. And we would like to see those documents because it wasn't practical at the time, last two years. With sure. GIZ. Um, secondly, renewable energy in Nigeria has to be practical. There's a lot of talk on how to um, provide power for Nigerians. And I think in terms of financing, the best place where financing should go to in renewable energy is for SMEs. SMEs, they generate money, and they, able, and they will be able to provide payback loans, whatever any sum of financing that goes to it. How, and also, the design for SMEs is a lot cheaper than residential because they run during the day, and this is where the power is. So now they invest more on panels. Even if they don't have um, one factor, they can um, increase the panels overcompensate sure. to make sure they produce enough energy that they sure. use and they generate money and the system is a lot cheaper and they can pay for whatever they use. Excellent. I think the ESG, uh, uh, ESG. ESG yeah. should look at it and bring it to the government. 
I, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the meeting you had today. But I think they should bring it for the gov to, up to the government to be able to assess loans. I worked on this financing for the past three years, and the problem when it come, uh, the problem was that insurance, the systems, could not be insured, and banks, it was not viable for banks. Yeah. So if government can assess the funds and maybe cushion whatever insurance, then people, businesses, can assess these energy loans and be able to pay. Thank but you. commercial banks cannot do that. Thank, thank you very much. Three, three th takeaways from what you said. One is that uh, GIZ or NESP has done some cost analysis, which we're going to you know, reach out to them and see if we can. OK, so we'll, we'll get that. The second one is on SMEs. Um, earlier today, um, at the event at the villa, Shegu Adaju presented uh, a Baba who 18 months ago installed solar in his one barbin shop. And what that did for him was that instead of spending a thousand naira every day fueling his generator, you know, it now cost him about 5,000 naira a month. And because he no longer uses generators, it doesn't blow out his bulbs. So, and the bulbs cost about 500 naira. So he now s could save a lot more to escape that poverty trap. And in 18 months, he's set up two additional barbing shops. And from employing one other individual, he now employs 12 people. You know, so that's the story of SMEs, which we find very exciting and we continue um, to push. On the financing side, there are lots of ideas around having a power bank, you know, having insurance products, having pension funds invest in this. You know, it's for it's for NERC to understand that you know, this is a market that needs to evolve like a market. You know, and when all these things are put in place, um, we'll see more progress in the sector. So let me, let me just give you, uh, you know, one minute to make final comments, and then we can bring it to a close. OK, thank you very much. Uh, just to also add to the uh, issue of capital cost, uh, the options that you've laid out. One other option we've decided to leverage on uh, the development bank of nigeria that is Correct. being created now mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, private sector led we are trying to get the government them to extract a commitment about 25 percent of their lending should go to smes that are investing in renewable energy so uh, that that's another option that we sure. are bringing to the table and so well by way of my final comments the numbers now tell us that the cost of renewable energy looks positive in nigeria it's no longer about uh, what fiction uh, um, the myths are. And we need to stay the course to ensure that we translate that possibility into a reality. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Felix? We had the first uh, experience from doing um, a lot of calculations is that it is always important what is, what is the actual uh, uh, data. And so if you today calculate uh, economics of PV with data even from 2015, this is outdated. Uh, so, and we, so we will see a dramatic, a further dramatic decrease of investment costs and um, from my observations, the next revolution is uh, a revolution that is before the door is the cost collapse for the storage. And, uh, and we see this very clearly uh, that, that, the, that the cost of storage is on the same cost reduction trajectory that, have, that we have seen for the last 15 years uh, for the PV. Uh, and uh, then there will be a mechanism. I think if the world, if the global capacity additions in a few years will exceed 100 gigawatt annually, or even the last Nigerian bank will understand that there is the business which somehow needs to be dealt with. And I think what, I've, what, what, what the real challenge is in your, com in your complicated setting is to bring forward smart financing. And I think this, we, we have these smart financing tools also for the conventional investments. 
if you look what is there on export import insurance with what what hedging tools are there etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think if you imagine what is the what is the framework of financial tools and financing tools which is available for large scale investments this environment needs to be translated to the more distributed more decentralized level and i think if this translation is done uh, I'm, I'm i'm extremely optimistic that renewables will fly and i would promise that in 2025 you start you will start a debate if 10 gigawatts of renewables in 2030 is probably less ambitious and you need to you need to go forward because i think if you if you look to the global numbers and if you look to the nigerian population and then you have a rough rough share of what could be implemented here then you then you quickly will exceed uh, the 500 megawatts on an annual basis and then uh, i'm pretty optimistic uh, uh, that that there will be a much more aggressive rollout of uh, of renewables especially and that's my that's my personal view that i personally feel that the potential of uh, of wind energy uh, in Nigeria is widely understated. Uh, I think if you look to the Morocco tenders, 2.6 euro cents is an important issue. Yeah. And the last message is, the good thing is, there a lot of progress will be delivered by the world market. But you have a chance for quick takeoff. And uh, uh, off-grid PV combined with storage is in the end of the day a no-brainer in economic terms and social terms and others. And so you have the possibility to, to have a quick takeoff in the off-grid sector and you have the task for creating all this environment for the on-grid PV and the on-grid renewables that will take time but if the fundamental mechanisms are in place, there will be an explosion of investment in this area. Excellent. Well, a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> We're excited about the report uh, that was put together by Harry Bull and the Nigeria Economic Summit Group because of the data it now presents to us, you know, to guide policy. Um, we're excited to see the role that gas can continue to play, but more interestingly, what renewable energy you know, should be able to do for us as we head out into the future. As we look at global trends around the world, we see that that's where we need to um, align our efforts. We're excited about the cost comparison between you know, solar, or standalone solar systems in homes and also mini grids. When you compare that to diesel uh, generation, the key question is that acquisition cost. And we know that there's some you know, work that's going on, a lot more support, a lot more of this type of numbers need to be presented to the policy people to be able to make the right policy. So uh, this is really exciting times for, for all of us as we face, look at the challenges that continue to confront us. But more importantly, we thank you for uh, deciding to spend this evening with us. Um, we meet every third Wednesday of the month. We moved it to Tuesday this time because of Ramadan and we didn't know where it was going to fall. You know, but typically we meet every third Wednesday of the month. And the idea is to continue to push the envelope, you know, push the ideas on how to advance the sector. Thank you very much for coming and uh, you've been a great uh, group. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.